All right, Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15. We need to fix this, Mike. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 15. We'll look at verse 15. All right, let's get serious with the word. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 15. Uh, I went through a, a, a very detrimental situation and experience that the Lord was able to use as a message. And I hope that it will help you. I hope that it will help you. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 15, and then we'll look at verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 15. The prophet Jeremiah is the one speaking in this passage. And if you recall, Jeremiah, he wanted to quit the ministry. Uh, he was all alone. He had a lot of unfair things happen in his life. Now, we know that there was a time that he even quit mentioning the name of the Lord. That's how bad it was. But then he quickly repented, got right with the Lord, got back on his feet and served the Lord. Now, in Jeremiah 15, 15, we can see a little, we can see a glimpse of that, of the heart of Jeremiah. And perhaps there are some people who have the same heart or who might have that same feeling of words of what you're about to read. Verse 15, O Lord, thou knowest, Remember me, and visit me, and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am, ca for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I sat not in the assembly of the mark, uh, mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again. And thou shalt stand before me, and if thou take forth the precious from the vial, thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Amen. Basically, 15 through 21 is a lot of words that we could probably express from our heart, but it comes down to basically two words that probably stick in your mind quite often. Why me? Let's pray. Amen. Father God, will you please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and cleansing of your blood? Thank you so much uh, for this message that you've given to me, and I pray that it's something that I could share with these people and that it will help them with their lives. You never failed me, not one time. Thank you for using me, Father, and use me again as I preach your word, your word, Heavenly Father. So preach to these people in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, my first point is verse 15. Why me? First uh, simple answer is because of persecutors. Because of persecutors. Look at verse 15. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me because, and revenge me of my persecutors. Now, it was so fitting. It was so well done, the revival meeting. I'm sure a lot of you got a blessing from Pastor Mike Fernandez, especially his last sermon. His last sermon was really good. In that sermon, he gave you something, and it is no coincidence that uh, it did happen. It did happen. Like, uh, as soon as he finished preaching, two people in our church got car accidents the same day. Can you believe that? And then I get, uh, I get uh, three calls for counseling, if not four, all right? So that was like really fast. So it is no surprise to some of us because we've been used to that. We've been used to the road that whenever we're doing something big and great for the Lord, something bad happens. And the reason why is very simple is because of the devil, because of persecution. The Bible says, and it is a law that does happen. It's a fact. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, it didn't say maybe, it says it will happen, shall suffer persecution. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21 says, yet, yet hath he not rude in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. 
Uh, one thing I've learned is you don't have to be 100% a good person to get any persecution. If you do anything godly, if you, for example, you just started attending a Bible-believing church and all of a sudden bad things started happening. Why? It's because you may not be that much of an important Christian, you might think, or a valuable asset in the church, but you did something godly that nevertheless contributed something that pleased the Lord or even helped out the church. Didn't you know even just your very own attendance benefits and helps out the people in the church? It pleases the Lord. Something so small like that is a godly thing that Satan does not want, so he'll send bad things that will happen to you, unfair things that will happen to you, so that why? So that you don't come to church anymore. It's simple. Uh, you will, you will suffer persecution. You will, no matter what. Unfair things will happen to you, no matter how insignificant you think you are. Somehow you benefited the family here, the Lord, or the church in some way. And guess what? That's something godly you did. And the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. And that verse points out even one soil that is not really fruitful for the Lord. But even that soil that tried to do something for the Lord, even small, the verse says persecution happened to that soil. See, that persecution can even happen to those who do something small, a godly thing. It could be like coming out soul winning one time. It could be helping out the kitchen one time, helping out the nursery one time, attending a Zoom meeting one time, or participating in one by one one time, or something small, even giving money to the church. You don't realize that something godly like that, the devil does not want. He wants to do everything that he can to throw you out of the race. Why? Because one more person in the church means a greater danger and a threat to the devil that's going to build up into 10 more people. So that's why he's going to attack. So why do these unfair things happen to me? Because you're in the devil's home territory. What did you expect? You're in one of his capital cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and hell, and you think he's happy when he hears that every single week there's a soul saved? How many times have I heard soul saved, soul saved, soul saved, so many times every week, you don't think that Satan, you think Satan's like, I'll leave you alone. You think that the devil's going to say, I'm going to leave this church alone. When someone tries to, when there's another person or several more people participating in discipleship class, one by one class, you really think that the devil, you're that naive to think Satan's going to say, I'm going to leave you alone. No, he knows what's going to happen. It's going to build. And once you're building to a strong point, he knows that there's no that he can't tempt he can't attack you as hard anymore. He knows that you're so strong that no matter what temptation he throws, it's too late for him. That's why it's so urgent for him to attack you now. Yeah. While you're discouraged, while you're weak, while you're thinking I failed again in my sin problem, that's his most important time to attack you. Cut you off from church immediately. You don't realize, if you don't think you're that special, all right, that you're that much of a valuable asset to the church, know this, the devil thinks so. Even if you don't think so, the devil thinks so. Because he knows that one more person coming in will encourage probably nearly all the church people. He wants that church so discouraged, so discouraged, where one person leaves, another person leaves, another person, and then what happens? Finally, the church folds. Keep sharing the call. So that's why you, I know it's unfair, you, but you're the only one trying to do something godly for the Lord while the rest of the people in this area, they're just going to hell faster than a handbasket and just going by the flow. Why would the devil bother with them? He sh uh, because they're just doing what he wants them to do. So he's going to pick on you. That's why it's you. So no surprise. Don't be surprised of that. Look at verse 17 through 18. 17 through 18. Why me? Well, simple, because you're having a pity party. That's why it's all about you. A pity party means not others. Pity party only, the only subject is you in pity party. You're the important person. You're the man of the party, okay? You're the birthday kid in the party, all right? Which is not happy birthday, but a sad birthday. Look at verse 17. 
I sat not. I sat not in the assembly of the mock mockers, nor rejoiced. See, I wasn't sinning. I sat alone because of thy hand, God, for thou hast filled me with indignation. I got mad because of you. It's all your fault, God. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a, whoa, liar and as waters that fail? Now, don't, don't sound so pious. Some of you had that moment here and there with the Lord. Uh, bitterness and anger. But, you know, Elijah say, gave the same complaint to the Lord, and he said in Romans chapter 11, verse 3 through 6, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone. Like Jeremiah, I am alone. Like you, I'm alone. And that's that same mindset. You're pitying yourself. And they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed down the, need to be, the image of Baal. Even so then at this, this, listen up, this present time, that means right now, what did the Bible say? Also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The reason why you think that unfair situations happen to you is very simple. It's because you see the bad things happening to you, but not at other people. So then the temptation rises, obviously, that whenever I do something godly for the Lord, something bad happens, so why bother doing it? And I'm the only unfortunate soul. Why? Because you see everybody else you know, being happy, having it better than you. They don't have this problem like you have. So that's the reason why you have that mentality of going through unfairness. But that verse says that there it, it's not, that verse pointed out something important. Everyone around you is not, you're not going to see everybody around you going through the same problem like you do. It's not a normal thing. Let's be honest, the things that you're going through is not a normal thing and it's very unfair because you're probably in that unique situation, that unique unfairness that's so painful. But that verse points out that it's not everybody around you. It says a remnant. So there's a remnant. There are people out there like you, but you just don't see them. That's the thing. So because you don't see them, that's why you think. You're all alone, and you're the unique one suffering. But if God showed you every single person who has the pain, what you're going to find out is this. The, you're going to find out, and I believe this with all my heart, there are people around the world who have the exact same personality like you do, the exact same problem that you're going through, the exact same circumstance that you're going through, the exact same experience you're going through. No, you're not the oddball. You're not the weirdo. You're not the special, unique person whose pain nobody understands. There are people out there around the world who have the same background, everything that's the same like you. And they are thinking probably the same thing like you that is so unfair, I'm the only one. Yeah. You know why it's so uh, easy to think that you're the only one is because all you're seeing is yourself, that's yeah. why. You don't meet these people every day. But the thing changes where it's interesting, like even AA meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Anonymous or something like that, some people might think that they have the story that's all about pain and hurt, but once they meet in a separate room with all those other people, they realize, wow, there's plenty of people like me. See, you're not in a setting like that that's set up that way. If it was, then you'd probably see hundreds of people like you, and then you'd realize, wow, I'm not the only one with this unfair issue. That's why you have to keep going. You might say, why do I have to keep going? Because those same hundreds of people who have the exact same problems like you, I guarantee a good number of them are lost and not saved. And they do not have Jesus Christ. But you do. Now, when you have it, what boggles my mind is you refuse to take advantage of that opportunity that only you have that other people don't have. Man, imagine if you were in their shoes where you were lost and without Christ, and then when you went through those problems, man, but you have that advantage of having Jesus Christ when you go through those same problems. Why not use it? Why do you waste it? 
Why waste what you have? Why do you waste prayer? Why do you waste uh, what the spiritual promises God has given to you? Why do you waste God, basically? Why are you wasting God when you don't have to, like a lot of people out there who are dying and going to hell while suffering the unfairness of this world? Why? Why don't you take advantage of what you have? That's why you have to keep going because there are plenty of people who are making it without Jesus Christ. You certainly can with Jesus Christ. You have to take advantage of Him by praying to Him, telling Him your problems, seeking His help, following what He told you to do. You need to do that so you can make it through. That's your only way to make it through. If you keep seeking other ways to make it through, that's why you're still repeating that miserable cycle, aren't you? you got to realize that's my only thing that I have and you need to humble yourself, forsake everything and take that only thing that you got. Otherwise, God's going to keep letting you repeat that cycle until you finally give up and realize this is all I got. Even if I don't want to do it, this is all I've got. I just got to keep going this route that God told me to do. That's a, mo that's a horrible thing to end up in that situation. It's better to do that much earlier. It's better to do that much earlier. It's very easy, I understand, to only see your pain and not all those people around you who are going through the exact same experience like you because you haven't seen them, you haven't witnessed it. But that's what's eye-opening is when you go, why me, why God? Simple, because God saw all those people and those experiences and those people's pain, not you. That's why. Because God sees not just one person, Gene Kim, in this unique problem, unique situation, unique pain. He sees 10 to 100 different people like him all at once. And probably a lot of them are saying, why me? And God's like, all of you are in the same boat together. <laughs> you have to understand that God sees a much bigger picture than yourself. All you're seeing is yourself, your pain, your problem, every specific detail, every stressful situation. But God sees more than that. God sees a hundred people like you who are going through that. Why? Because he's God. He sees everybody all at once. You have to understand that there's a much bigger picture than just yourself. You think the whole world revolves around you? Especially when the Bible points out that because of sin... Guess what? Unfairness has to happen. Because sin happens in our life, unfair consequences, unfair things have to happen in our lives. And because of unfairness that's spreading throughout all the world, God sees a much bigger picture than what you're seeing. You're only seeing the unfair consequence of sin in yourself. That's all you're seeing. But God, he's not seeing that. He's seeing the unfair consequence of sin, not just you, but with everybody everywhere around the world and he hears that every single day the cries of people every single day the whining every single day the people who are uh, calling out to him for pain every single day god sees all of that at once what makes you so special that you're that unique pain that needs to be met that needs to be specially cared for you're not that special. You're just a blip out of the billions. You have to understand that. You, that's why you got to get out of that pity party state. You're not that special that you think you are. There are plenty of people like you going through that pain. The only reason why you don't know is because you haven't met those people. But God met those people. God sees those people every single second. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. A lot of times we do foolish things because we don't think, we don't look at the whole bigger picture. We only see ourself, 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 and ourself. And that's why you think that your pain is so special and unique. You need to get out of yourself and look at the big picture around you. And when you look at that, your heart's going to break and you're going to forget your own grief and you're going to look at plenty of other people's grievances. That's what's going to happen. 
plenty of, uh, plenty of fatherless, motherless people, plenty of people who are uh, childless, plenty of people who have no parents, plenty of people who went through broken situations. You're just a blip of that. You're not that special, unique, special person that needs to be specially cared for. Do you understand why this environment has become more socialist now? Everyone is playing that special card, me. What about me? What about me? Yeah. It's a whole bigger picture than you. It's everybody. It's a whole system of people that's broken and hurt. My third point is because of people. Because of people. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. The Bible reads here, Therefore thus saith the Lord, If thou return, then I will bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vial, thou shalt be as my mouth, let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. What's that verse pointing out? God saying, if you decide to return, Jeremiah, get back into business again with me. All right, get out of that whining state, that uh, pity party state. I'm going to uh, bring you again. I'm going to use you again to stand before me and to preach, to be my prophet. If you take forth the precious from the vial, see, it's about people here. It's about people here. Thou shalt be as my mouth, let them return unto thee. He's saying, yeah, if you're able to have these souls saved, so to speak, these souls rescued, these people right with God, other people who are dying and in pain, if you were able to help them out and they return to you, but don't you dare return to them. Because why? They're in that down, pitiful, uh, sinful state. God doesn't want Jeremiah to join them. He wants those people to join where Jeremiah is back to God. And that's the devil's successful tactic is to get you out of here and join the people at the low, lowliness down here. That's what he wants you to do. No, God wants you to be here with him and he wants you to take other people up with you. What breaks the cycle, you have to understand, of this unfairness in the sinful world is when one person finally opens his or her eyes to say, hey, guess what? You know what I'm going to do? Is that I'm going to make sure that I'm the one that stands on top and then I can rescue other people and get them to stand on top with me. Wow, That's where everything starts and begins. You might say, why? Because if you run away from unfairness, the unfairness of pain, you forget this. Know this is that it will pass on to someone else. Even if you run away from pain, and you do, which I doubt, because I'm going to show you later on, but even if you do, that unfairness doesn't just linger or swim or disappear. It finds somebody else to pass it upon. You know that? Let's say that I, as a pastor, quit. You know where that unfairness, that pain, that burden is going to lie upon? The people here. What if a parent gives up on God? That unfairness, that pain is going to lie upon the children. What if the next generation runs away from pain? And that's what every generation is doing. Playing victimization card, running away from pain, guess what? They pass it on to the next generation, the next generation. And in colleges, I hear this in universities, they say, Guess who's going to help us from this economy? And the teachers look at the students, you. You guys are the one who's going to take the brunt of all the tax force and save the economy and everything. How unfair. You know why? Somebody has failed and they ran away from the unfair pain. That's what's going to happen. You know, uh, there's an illustration that's a famous illustration. I think it's a true story too. Is that there was a father who was in charge of the train tracks and he would uh, con uh, control the tracks of the train. Now, one time this train was going, and then the man who is in charge of the train track has to switch tracks, because if he doesn't switch track, then the train's going to go down the wrong track, and then uh, hundreds of people will be killed. But it turned out that his only child, that uh, his little boy, was actually in the right track where the train is supposed to go. And it was too late for the father. There's no way he can run and save the child. And he's like, I can either pull that lever down and have hundreds of people rescued where they go down the right track, but I'm going to lose my child. Or I can save my child and have these hundreds of people die. What happened was he sacrificed his own child and the train ran over that poor child. And guess what? 
Hundreds of those people in that train had no idea about the pieces of body and the blood and the gore that just fell out of the train tracks and not even a thank you. How do you think that person felt? You know what my point is? You have to realize that that is the situation that you're in. Why? Because we live in a world called sin. If we live in a place called Eden, if there was no sin, housing situation, family situation, money situation, everything would be perfect. But because of sin, that's why everything falls apart. Oh, well, why is it that I have to pay my bills? Housing so difficult. What do you think how this started? Sin. What did you expect? Because of sin, that's why it's happening. And everything is falling apart. That's why some people want to run away from here and they go to a different state, right? But guess what they've done? Now that state will suffer the unfair pain. Do you see that? That thing don't just disappear. Uh, the unfair pain that results from sin is going to pass to somebody. And when people keep running away and dodging it, it's going to build up and pass on to somebody. And when those people run away, it's going to build up even more. Do you understand that? So that's the time that we're living in. You're at that time where you do have to pull down that lever and you have to make sacrifices. A life without sacrifice is fantasy. Even economically speaking, society speaking, as I studied every historical timeline, a civilization that I was its peak of richness immediately fell into starvation and broken and ruined. Even America during uh, what they had, was it uh, Roaring Twenties or something like that? Even what they were living out in richness, what happened immediately? Economy went downhill. They got the Great Depression. Same thing with the recession too. But guess what? It's the same thing with today. What happens? See, the reason why is you can't escape, no matter how much you try, you can't escape from the unfair pain of sin. It's gonna, it lives forever until God casts it to the lake of fire and restores everything. It's gonna linger and fall upon something unless someone is willing to make the sacrifice. If not you, then who? You can trust the next generation who's even more heightened in sensitivity when the technology has gotten them addicted even more. You trust them. Why don't you break the cycle? Why don't you be the one willing to make the sacrifice? Right. Why not? Uh, why not? Because I don't understand why your conscience cannot be bothered. Imagine if I was that father and then I did save my child. And I had a right to. I have a right to save my child. But how can I live every night with those hundreds of people dead? It's hard, isn't it? Either or you got to realize the conscience is going to be bothered. What if I ran away from this ministry? What happens is my conscience cannot sleep after that. How can you sleep and live every day without your conscience being bothered because you ran away from the unfair pain? That's what happens. Unfair pain lasts and seeps in. Why? Because you don't want it. So guess what? You pass that burden to somebody else now. Or someone's going to get hurt if you run away from that unfair pain. Wow. Someone will. Someone will. Or, this is even worse, someone could even die and go to hell if you run away from that unfair pain. If I quit this ministry five years ago, I wonder how many souls would have gotten saved. Wow. How many would die and burn in hell? You know what your problem is? You're not seeing a bigger picture do you understand that? You have to see a bigger picture here. Wow. You have to see a bigger picture here. The unfairness of pain is not all about just you or even people that are close to you. It's much larger than that. It's people around you as well as an entire system. Yeah. Amen. Someone's going to get hurt. Wow. Because Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Galatians chapter 6 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know what? That, those verses demand this. Sin has to have payment. Yeah. Wow. 
Why do you think there's e eternal hell fire? There's no such thing as running away from the consequences of sin. You get away with it. No, there is a payment. That's horrible about Man, it's so unfair, Pastor. That's right. Good. I'm glad you agree with me. Can you agree that's how unfair sin is? Then why do you play around with it? How about that? Sin is so unfair. It doesn't care who you are, man, woman, or child. Sin could care less. It want sin, the price is starvation, people dying, people in broken homes, suicide, and worst of all, burning and gnashing their teeth in a place of torment. You think sin cares about your life? Amen, Pastor. That's horrible about sin. You have to pay the price one day with sin. You might think that you can run away from the unfair pain, but I promise you this, is that sin, the verse says, be sure your sin will find you out. It will find you. It's such a nasty verse. It will find you. It will find you one day. And the consequences do happen. What's the proof? Ask the people whose consequences did happen. The people who thought that they could get away with it for a while, and now they're reaping it. And they're still not done reaping it. Even after repenting and cleaning their life, they're still reaping the consequence. Why? Because they spent more years running away. It's best to face the music now and not run away. Because the more you run away, the more that payment for sin will grow. And when it lands on you on all fours, you try running away again, it will land on you all fours again. And not only that, remember, it's not just you, it's going to affect somebody else too. It's a horrible system. That, that cycle needs to be broken. That can only break when somebody is willing to sacrifice. Do you understand that? That's why sacrifice is so important. In verse 20, is so important. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Man, that's encouraging. God says to Jeremiah that unlike any other person, people, you're the one that I prefer to protect and to use. And that no matter how many of these unfair situations happen, I'm going to somehow use it for my glory. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. And then I'll pull you through. Amen. You have to understand that. You know why that... You have to understand this. Do you believe God that everything happens for a reason, even the bad things that you made? Yeah. God can... All things work together for good. It is God's job to make sure that everything falls into a systemized format where that cycle can finally be broken if there is that one willing to pay the price. And he's going to make sure that it fits you perfectly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know that? He's going to make sure that it fits you perfectly. You might say, why me? Because you're preferred. You're preferred. You have to realize you are that unique one, perfect for that unique task, who can break that cycle. Amen. Do you realize that? It can be, it doesn't have to be big. It can even be something so small. Something so small. Esther chapter 4, verse 13 through 14 says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Mordecai says, Don't think you're going to run away. This unfair burden, this task where all the Jews are going to get annihilated, you can't run away from that. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Why me? Who knows if God appointed you to be that hero that can finally break that unfair cycle that so many people in pain are finally seeking after. you got to realize even the prosperity of America didn't come without price, without sacrifice. Everything pays a heavy price. Everything. That's a law. Even if God didn't exist, there is a law. Somebody has to sacrifice. That cycle can only break if someone is willing to pay the price. Is that you? In every 
People love superhero movies and stuff like that. Why is that? The hero that can rescue and save the people. And a lot of times that hero goes through that unfairness, that burden. Why? Because he or she is the only unique person that has that power, that ability, that can rescue those people. It's you. You're the only one. You're that superhero, you got to realize, that can rescue that person, rescue those people. Otherwise, let's all run away and let's see how many souls will be saved in this area. Let's all run away and let's see that there will be singing and shouting in this area. Let's all run away and let's see how much sin won't grow even farther. Let's all run away and let's see how many more souls we can rescue and introduce them to Bible-believing truth. Hey, man, let's see how many. You, 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 you. Unsung hero, you. You're the Superman. Hey, Superman, are you willing to take up that cape and rescue and break the tragedy and the cycle and go out doing your job again, rescuing people and not pity partying yourself and thinking about your woes? Because you're the unique one that God has placed and set up everything and he promised to give you the grace and strength. Amen. Won't you pick up your mantle and start to rescue somebody today? Isaiah 4, 48, verse 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the fire of affliction. You're the hero who can make the difference and change. Think about how uh, uh, some of you, think about how some of you ended up in this church. Uh, I thought about quitting so many times, even five years ago, actually. If I drop down my mantle and my superhero abilities, oh, how, how would have you gotten saved or probably ended up in this church? Or people watching us online today, how would you have gotten saved and ended up in this church? You're the hero who can make the difference in change. You might say, why? All God needed was one to sacrifice and not think about other people doing the work for him, but just one person to make the sacrifice, come out here at the age of 21 and to make a difference in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. Just one. It just takes one to produce this, to counsel and help other people in pain, to make sure other souls get saved. God just has one. 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 And it breaked. It broke a cycle. It broke a cycle. It made a difference. If I was that victim, like all the other victims here, drowning out and crying out for Superman, save me, Superman, save me, who would be the Superman? It's so easy to think about unfair situations that's happening to you and you and you and you and you, but it's easy for Superman to think that too. But you have to realize that with whatever God has given to you, if you have any cent in your pocket, any ability that you have, any effort that you can give, or any sweat or sacrifice you can pull, the Lord can use that amazing thing to turn it into Superman. Yes. Yes. And you're that Superman that needs to contribute Amen. to break that cycle and rescue souls in this area, rescue your home, and yes, you can even rescue yourself. Amen. 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 Verse 21, verse 21, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Because of promise, that's my last point, because of promise, God made a promise to Jeremiah, and that's what keeps me going, is when I remember his promise. Amen. Luke twenty two thirty two 32 is so encouraging. But I have prayed for thee, that's Jesus, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Isn't that encouraging? That's a promise Jesus gave to me. You know, what keeps me going? I have to remember his promise. Jesus said, I'm praying for you, Gene. 
I'm praying for you. And that keeps me going. You know, uh, I have to tell myself, not because I'm all that, but because it's the thing that can keep me going. And you need to tell yourself this, is that, you know, you are strong enough to handle it. You are Superman. You are that hero that can make a difference. I need to tell myself that. And I'm not talking about the positive heresy about Joel Osteen, you're special and, you know, you're wonderful and you're such a hero and something like that. No, it's not because that I am that way, but more so I need to picture myself, not me, but rather God telling me that. Yes. Why? Because in his words, it's so much filled with promise yeah. that you are strong to handle it, that you will be used for my glory. Now, you're the one that I specially chosen for this. But do you tell yourself that? Do you let God tell you that? You don't, do you? You let Satan tell you, right? You're guilty. You're miserable. You're weak. You're hurt. You're pathetic. And this cycle will continue. You let the devil talk to you. You need to let the Lord speak to you. You need to let the Lord call you out and say, Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I will supply all your need. Hey, that uh, whatever you go through in this life will pale in comparison to up in glory. Can you picture Jesus cheering you on? <laughs> you don't, do you? The Bible says looking unto Jesus. You're not looking at Jesus. Look at Jesus and saying, hey, it's tough, but uh, just a little bit longer, a little bit longer. It's, I'm going to give you a big blessing that you won't regret. Wow. I'm going to turn this all around. You don't tell yourself that. You don't look at that. You know, I always get upset at Paul. I feel like Paul's the cheater. The reason why he went through, was able to bear all the suffering is because he saw God face to face cheering him on. But that's the problem. My problem is, is that you know, I don't need to see him face to face to have him tell me that. I have his word. Yeah. I just never made it alive to me. That was my problem. I just never made it alive to me. That verse is in Luke 24, 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Amen. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm going through a hard time, if I have a fellow pastor who went through the same thing that I went through, the pain, and he just said, you know, thank you so much for what you're doing. You're helping. You're helping the ministry. That helps me keep going. Yeah. But how come I can't picture that with Jesus Christ? Oh, wow. Shouldn't his compliment be greater that, hey, you're doing a good job, son? Good, wow. Just something simple like that? Amen. That's good. Oh, carry me a mile away. It's funny. What carries people a mile away is a stupid piece of paper, you know. B.A., you know. M.A., you know. <laughs> Basically, good job. And then, oh, this is what I worked for four years for. And those people don't even care, you know. They just want to sign it on a piece of paper and that's it. You, you, got, you got a thousand pieces of paper right here. Yeah. And you don't see that where God's saying, good job, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I mean, you don't saturate yourself with the word. We don't have the living word down here where we see face to face, but we have his word in our heart. And you need to make that alive to you. You need to saturate yourself in that, melt yourself in that, melt yourself and get so lost that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Amen. Day unto day utter his speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And then where God says that fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I mean, if thou hast been faithful in a few things, thou shalt be ruler over many things. I did not let Jesus compliment me. I instead let the devil discourage me. I need to let the Lord compliment me. I need to, let, to, to remember his, what he promised to me. If you went through a lot of hard times, okay, but then the person say, just stick out a year with this hardship 
and then uh, I'll take care of you for life. You'll be a billionaire. You and I are going to go through the stressful, strenuous places at the workplace so that we can become a billionaire because it's just one year. But God, you don't picture God saying to you, hey, man, for eternity, man, for eternity, man, man, you're going to be ruler of over nations, man, gold, silver, precious stones, not a billion pieces of paper, you know. Yeah. Man, I mean, uh, if God said that to you in person, imagine, look unto Jesus with me, will you please today? Imagine God saying that to you just a little longer. Hang in there. I'm going to give you this, 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 and this. Amen, brother. Amen. Then you might say, okay, I'll just hang on a little more, Lord. But you don't look unto Jesus. You don't picture that. Imagine you are that. Do you realize that? You are the chosen. You are that superhero that can break the unfair cycle of the pain of sin. Somebody is crying out to you, rescue me, save me. Will you be that person to take up the mantle? And then as you go through pain and as you go down, can you picture, I mean, be in the realistic plane, be in the spiritual world with me today, will you? Can't you see God in front of you saying, Man, that pain that you're going through right now, it hurts so much, doesn't it? I feel for you. But guess what? In heaven, it's going to erase all of that. You don't even remember it. Yeah. And I'm, that pain you're feeling right now, every moment of that, every moment of that, look at this, son. See that piece of gold? Okay, see that mansion right there? Okay, see that blessing from tragedy? I could turn it for good. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And then... If you and I saw that, like, point blank, face to face, you and I would charge hell with a squirt gun and wouldn't care one bit what happened. But the problem is, is that we're not in that spiritual world and looking at that. That's why the Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on this earth. And you're not looking above. And you need to look at that. You need to see Jesus smile at you. You need to see Jesus smile at you and say... Let me give you a big hug. And then he warms your heart and say, that's okay. You can keep crying, child. You can keep pouring your complaints to me because I can take it. Pour it out to me. And you need to picture that. And then at the judgment seat of Christ, oh, what glory. Can you picture that every pain that you went through in life and God showed it and that he showed it off to the people and say, see what my child did? See what he or she did? You see what he or she did? And then imagine those crowds of people in heaven shaking your hand and you have no idea. I got saved because of you. Thank you so much. You saved my life because of your testimony, because of that money you gave to the church, the attendance that you gave, that small word of encouragement that you said to me as a pastor that, that I didn't quit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then you get so many hands shaking you because you're the superman you're the superman you're the superhero because that's your time judgment seat of christ it's a time you get your just reward and then god says well done thou good and faithful servant here you go and then god gives you something and what are you gonna do you can't just help but fall on your knees and say if only i knew what heaven would be like so much earlier i would have a better motivation to serve you yeah. I would have not let pain and trial and depres depression control and rule over my life. I would have stuck out a little more. I would have tried to win a few more souls to you. I would have tried to think about a few more other people who are in pain and help them out. I would have tried a little harder. What a beautiful day and time. But you need to Look unto Jesus. You need a picture and see that. You don't. You don't. The devil blinded you. You heard the devil's discouragement. You're seeing the devil's hallucinations of what bad thing can happen because of this bad thing happening. You've locked yourself in his television show. Break free and see the reality. And the reality is that spirit world where God says, I'm here. I never left you. Amen. Let me encourage you even more. You know what's exciting than that? 
what I told you is not even the half of it. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath the things entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Pull up the best imagination that you can of Jesus rewarding you and encouraging you. The verse says, your imagination can't even cover the half of it. Why me, Lord? You say that down here on earth, but I guarantee you this, every one of you up in heaven, when you see that that goes beyond your imagination, you can't help but just fall on your, your knees and say, why me, Why me? Every head bow and every eye shut. The piano will come forward and play us a song. And we'll play over and over again. Why me? Why me? There's a song that goes, who am I that a king should bleed and die for? Who am I to say, not my will, but thine be done? <sighs> what a God. What an awesome God we serve that can take unfairness, the brutality, the horror of sin, and transform it into something beautiful where you are the protagonist. You are the main character. You are that hero. And God says, here you go. You and I would say, I never asked for this. I never signed up for this. I never wanted this power, this gift. I see it more as a curse. But God said to you, Superman, no, it's going to be something important. You're going to save so many lives out there. You're going to contribute and help someone. If only, if only you would let me. If only you would let me. Hey, Superman, one day you'll be the one holding that mantle, crying with tears in your eyes and saying to God, Why me? Why would you use me? I'm not worthy. I'm undeserving. And if the unfairness of sins happens, you should have left it alone, Lord. Why would you use me to create something beautiful? Well, that's our God. He creates something beautiful. If you only knew Gene Kim long time ago, if only you knew me long time ago, I was such a nobody. Such a person that was aloof. Such a person who would every single person worry about that. How is he going to make his way in life? But because I had God, that was my only thing. Because I had God, I'm living in miracles. So many miracles out of my life. Not because I make the miracles. God used me. <laughs> God used me. To give the miracles to you. Be a miracle to somebody's life today. Be a miracle to somebody's life today. Why me? Well, because of persecutors. The devil don't like Superman. The devil don't like you. He, he's the antagonist. He wants people to die and burn in hell. That's why it's you. Why me? Well, because... All you're thinking about is yourself. You're pity partying. But there are other heroes out there like you. You're not the only Superman. Join your brothers and sister in the trench of war. Let's overcome together. Don't think you're so special. Why me? Well, because of people. That's the bottom line. People are dying going to hell. People are going to face hurt if you run away from the pain. Someone's going to get hurt. That's why you need to stick on. Why me? Because of preference. You fit well. You're at that time, that place, that situation, 
that no one else can be in but you. And God wants to use you to finally break that cycle. Why me? (laughs) Well, because he promised you. Because he promised you that he'll take care of you, that he loves you, and that he'll use you. I'll never understand why me, but all I know is that he promised me, and I'm just going to just thank him for the promise. That's it. What else can I do? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, uh, I don't know why you used me to preach this sermon. There are plenty of other people who can have the delivery, the skill, the style, the age, the maturity, the character trait that can deliver this sermon more brilliantly than I can. I'll never understand, but you did use me. You used my pain, my unfairness of everything I went through in my life to create this sermon that could perhaps rescue somebody out there. I don't know why you used me, but thank you. Thank you, Father. May we come home not with grumbling, but with gratitude that you chose us, that you will use us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.